An alert though from the 12 news storm trackers here at 6. They've got their eyes on the skies. They're expecting some significant rain overnight and early tomorrow. And there's a potential threat that it could turn severe through the night, mainly for the lakes area. Isolated tornadoes and severe thunderstorms with damaging winds and hail are possible. And within the past hour, the National Weather Service has put most of the area under a severe thunderstorm watch. Chief Meteorologist Patrick Vaughn's got the storm tracker radar fired up for us tonight. Patrick, you're already seeing storms out there. Yeah, just to the northwest of uh, our area already now a severe thunderstorm warning has just been issued for Tyler County. County, uh, north and uh, western sections of the county until 7 p.m. as this line of showers and thunderstorms severe in nature continues to move towards the county. Large hail indicated over towards West Livingston and again these are moving off towards the east and northeast at about 35 miles an hour. So all these counties are under severe thunderstorm warnings because of damaging wind and hail and uh, north of the triangle for Hardin, Tyler, Jasper, Newton counties under a severe thunderstorm watch until 11 p.m. But wait, that's not all. Uh, in addition to the severe threat, we've got the potential for very heavy rainfall. Uh, one to three, maybe double that as far as inches. And now all the lakes area under a moderate risk of flash flooding. And the slight risk of flash flooding extends along I-10, including the Triangle. Flash flood watch in effect for Tyler, Northern Jasper, Norton or Newton counties until 1 p.m. tomorrow. Otherwise, Futurecast doing a good job showing showers and thunderstorms gradually moving in towards the Triangle late tonight with additional shower and thunderstorm activity during the first half of the day tomorrow. More on your storm tracker forecast coming up on 12 News. We have breaking new developments now at 6 about an inmate on the run in Orange County. Detective Joshua Lockett says this man, Drew Paul, escaped from an Orange County transport van while handcuffed and shackled. Deputies don't expect him to get very far. In fact, they have set up a perimeter along West Freeway Boulevard. Now, Jordan James is live in Rose City tonight with the very latest. Days unique. This search has been going on for over three hours. Multiple agencies across Orange County and Jefferson County have all joined forces to try to locate Drew Paul. We've seen deputies on horses, on foot, even in a helicopter trying to locate him. Take a look at some video that we shot moments ago. The sheriff's office tells us that Paul pleaded guilty to a drug violation this morning in Orange County Court. 12 News has learned that Paul entered a plea agreement for felony possession of a controlled substance, but he was not sentenced during proceedings. That meant that he would have to go back to jail. Following the hearing, Paul told deputies that he was feeling sick, so they took him to a Beaumont hospital. On the way back to Orange County, Paul made a bold move jumping out the van and taking off right into the woods along the interstate. Get this, still wearing shackles. Moments ago, we caught up with Sheriff Mooney and spoke to him about the challenges first responders are facing out here. Definitely a challenge, you know, the heat out here today. A lot of these guys have their bo uh, body armor on. Uh, the dogs, you know, they're, they have hair on them, you know, and stuff like that. So they get hot and they get tired. So, uh, you know, it's definitely an issue when we have to deal with the heat and then also the humidity out in the woods because it is, it's, uh, it's tough terrain out there right now. Paul isn't believed to be armed considering he didn't have any weapons when he broke out of the transport van. You know, back out here live, they still have not found him. If you see anyone who looks like Paul, you're advised not to approach him, but contact the Orange County Sheriff's Office. For now, reporting here live in Orange County, Jordan James, 12 News. Good information there. And in Power City tonight, 5,500 miles of pipeline stretching from southeast Texas to New Jersey, still offline a day after the worst cyber attack yet on American infrastructure. Now, economists say it will surely affect those along the East Coast, but will we have to pay more at the pump? Very good question. 12 News investigator Leticia Cahey, she's been digging into how the cyber attack impacts southeast Texans. Yeah, Jordan and Dej, um, the problems all started on Friday when the pipeline was hacked and held ransom by who authorities believe to be the Russian criminal group called Darkside. Now that prompted the shutdown of one of the largest fuel pipelines in the U.S. And southeastern states get about half of their gasoline, diesel, and jet fuel from this pipeline. So because the demand is high and the supply is now limited, those in the southeast are expected to see prices spike at the pump. But states like Georgia, Virginia, and North and South Carolina will see higher prices 
crisis and even experienced some gas outages. Fortunately for Southeast Texas, we shouldn't see these same hikes because the Colonial Pipeline doesn't service Texas. And according to Gas Buddy, um, Monday's gasoline demand skyrocketed nearly 20%. But that doesn't mean you should go rushing to fill up. Andrew Gross from AAA has a message for drivers. Now is not the time to be gas hoarding, you know, get gas if you need it, but if you don't need it, don't rush off and, and go buy some. This is a hopefully temporary situation. This Again, according to Gas Buddy, Southeast Texas is not expected to see major price hikes connected to the Colonial Pipeline hack. But here's where Gas Buddy says drivers will feel some pain at the pump. 8.5% of gas stations reporting outages in North Carolina and 7.7% of gas stations reporting outages in Virginia. So how are prices looking in our region right now? They average about $2.55. Now, if we do see prices at the pump go up, experts say it's important to keep in mind other factors like the shortage of truck drivers and summer travel. Letitia Cahey, 12 News. Developing tonight, we're learning more about this student protest in Kirbyville. Here's video of those students in front of the district's administration building. Now, Superintendent Georgia Sayer says this all happened over a personnel matter involving Principal Holly Ferreras. 12 News reporter Amelia White spoke with both women this afternoon. She is live with what we know tonight. Yeah, Jordan Dage, it was certainly not a typical day at school today in Kirbyville. I spoke with Superintendent Georgia Sayers by phone. She declined to do an interview with us, but she tells me Faraz was not terminated or fired. She's actually still an employee with the district and will continue to be next year. We pressed the superintendent asking if Faraz was reassigned and she said no. She declined to provide more details, citing this was a personnel matter. Faraz has served as principal of Kirbyville High School for three years, but now the Kirby Kirbyville High School assistant principal will step in to take care of the duty day to day duties. This was a scene at Kirbyville High School around 9 a.m. this morning. Students and teacher walked out of protesting after a personnel matter involving their principal. They marched off campus and marched back onto campus for 30 minutes. During the protest, they stood in front of Kirbyville IS, ISD administrative office chanting, what do we want for Reyes? When do we want it now? And just hours later, they went back to class. Now, 12 News did reach out to Ferez for comment, but she says she is unable to comment at this time. I'm live in Beaumont, Amelia White, 12 News. Developing tonight, meet your new Beaumont City Council. A.J. Turner and Chris Dorio won seats that W.L. Pate and Robin Mouton vacated to run for mayor. It was a really busy day in City Hall. Council members Mike Getz from Ward 2 and Audwin Samuel from Ward 3 easily won re-election. Ward 1 Council Member Taylor Neal did not face any challengers and he'll hold on to his council seat. Now during the swearing-in ceremony, W.L. Pate got a standing ovation for his service after current Mayor Becky Ames took the time out to thank him. Him. Pace at large seat will now go to Turner. Randy Felshaw will keep his at large position on the council. New council members say they're excited to get to work. I'm just glad that uh, the citizens saw fit to elect me to represent them. I've been in Ward 4 my whole life, worked in Ward 4, and I'm ready to go to work. So I'm real happy right now. Still soaking it in, but uh, it's, it's hit me. You know, it's time to go to work, and I'm actually a city council member for Beaumont, Texas. Right now, there are no women on the city council. Former councilwoman Robin Mouton will face businessman Roy West in a runoff for the mayor's seat. That's set for June 19th. All right, just down the highway in Orange, newly re-elected Mayor Larry Spears was sworn in today. Mayor Spears took his oath of office while surrounded by friends and family. He was then presented with a certificate of election by Mayor Pro Tem Paul Birch. Spears has served as Orange's mayor since 2018. For the first time, Silsby ISD will have its own police force with veteran Hardin County law enforcement officer Kenny Davenport at the helm. Davenport spent his entire career working for Silsby Police and the Hardin County Sheriff's Office. He's been the school resource officer the past two years. The department will be starting off with four officers.